On this episode of Star Trek Universe, Effie and I walk through a talking time pastry to a time-long past, steer clear of police officers and mechanical rice pickers, kids. The future has to be brighter than this, it just has to get a hell of a lot darker first. We're discussing the city on the edge of forever, right after these words from Killers Assassins! <laughs> Welcome into Star Trek Universe. We are continuing our rewatch slash first watch of Star Trek, the original series. Today, we are hitting up the City on the Edge of Forever, written initially by Harlan Ellison, and then written by him again and again, and then very famously tinkered with by Gene L. Coon, DC Fontana, and most famously by Gene Ronberry himself. We'll mm. get into that part in a bit, though. I'm your host... David C. Robertson, rest assured, I won't kill you. It is they who do the killing. <laughs> this is a... Uh... You're just going to leave me hanging with like, oh, I, I should have come up with a funny no. line from the episode. How dare you? No, 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 I'm not. I actually... I'm Effie. I've just, I've, I've watched the episode. That's all I do. Yeah. Damn it. <laughs> no. I, you know what? I was going to say, this is a re, 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 uh, Fair enough. <laughs> and then I was going to say, I was going to motion to you, and then you would say what you were going to say, who you were and shit. But yeah, ah, right, right, right. So up. I fucked up the order. You that's, did. That's, that's a damn shame. Yeah. I really just wanted to put in the I won't kill you. It is they who do the killing line from McCoy. Yeah, I, yeah, that was good. The criminally short memory alpha synopsis, Kirk and Spock go back in time to save McCoy and their own universe. I mean, yeah, technically correct, but indeed, wow, that leaves out a lot. <laughs> yeah, it does. I yeah. guess if you really want the synopsis to not spoil anything beyond the premise, there will be time travel, I guess. And then you just leave out everything that happens for most of the episode. Yeah. It's not quite a synopsis, but, you know. So, uh, I personally feel like this is the best episode of Star Trek ever. Mm -hmm. It's not my favorite. But Ooh. I think it's... That's it, an interesting distinction. Yeah. It, and that should give you some uh, hope for the future. Like, it would be really awful <laughs> if you got to The City on the Edge Forever and I was just like, well, you just watched the best episode of Star Trek. No point in going forward. Yeah, yeah. Because it did feel like that for a second where I was absolutely like, well, it's all downhill from here, I guess. Uh, no, the, the, I mean, I, I get it, but... Christ. <laughs> I, I think there are others that are on the same level, I, mm. and I think some surpass it, but mm. I think many surpass it, honestly. But City on the Edge of Forever, I think, is just so iconic, mm. and it does a really good job with the time travel element of the story. It does a really good job with choosing a personal sacrifice for the good of the galaxy. Yeah, yeah. They did they did so much really cool stuff that's been built upon later on. You know, it's like the Citizen Kane of Star Trek. Where it's okay, just like okay. yeah, Oh Christ, sense. this is the way you make an episode. Oh yeah. and it's still Because it is. <clears throat> yeah. Really hard hitting even in mm -hmm. modern times. Yeah, no, it it works perfectly well. Like this is one where I'm like, mm, I'm almost mad that you're gonna ruin it with production knowledge for me. Because I, I was willing to assume it was just all Harlan Ellison and, and, and like, I'm fine. It is, I, no notes. Go ahead. This is this is good shit. I want more of this. Uh-huh. Um, I'm sure you'll mention ways in which it could have been better and then, you know, people sabotage that. But uh, other than that, no, I'm very happy to watch this. It is just okay. tight, very, like, like, great moments, dialogue set up. Like, yeah, it all... It's not it's not necessarily completely new terrain in this era anymore, but that's because it's just it's very fucking good. It's mm -hmm. it just it works on every level. It is a much more simplistic character piece. It puts the the two leads in a situation where you're just following them for an extended period of time, which hasn't happened a whole lot. 
Yeah. It's not just a day on the fucking Enterprise. It's like, no, we're stuck here for a while and we better hope that we fix whatever went wrong. And you slowly figure out what went wrong and it's just delightful. It's just very well manufactured. It's tightly written. I love that. Yeah, it's very tightly written. And this is one of those situations, I am happy to tell you, where the artist, quote unquote, got mm-hmm. his shit messed with and... I love Harlan Ellison. Like he did. <laughs> he his sensibilities do not fit Star Trek completely. That makes sense. I I could imagine that. So now, then again, I would probably also have sensibilities that you know would fuck with that a bit. So uh-huh. so I can relate. Like I'll probably still like his idea, but yeah. I am. Um, yeah. Some sometimes constraints, you know, help it fit into established stuff. Yeah. So um, when I look at this and say, oh, it was, you know, rewritten by Gene Alcoon and then DC Fontana and then Gene did some tinkering himself at the very end. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at Gene Alcoon and DC Fontana and going, oh, this is them like course correcting a Harlan Ellison story. Yeah. And shaping it into a Star Trek story. Which makes sense. It's just Roddenberry, who I don't trust as a writer. It is Roddenberry, who I don't trust as a writer, (laughs) um, usually. Uh, But honestly, this episode, I don't think the Harlan Ellison version is better than this episode. Not by a mile. Knowing how how much you like the guy, like... mm. It is not, you know, it's not nearly as uh, imaginative in some ways. Mm. It's a little more uh, straightforward. Right, it's it's more of the we'll core concept than, yeah. No, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I I want to hear the differences now. There's multiple versions of a thing. Yeah, give me the ultimate edition. Oh, you where can... is my Zack Snyder's Justice League? <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> you... I want to read the script for the original. You yeah. Know. Uh, yeah, you can. I figured. They've I figured by now it. it'd be released. Oh yeah, yeah. and like it's been published in script form. And IDW a few years ago made a. Uh, a comic mm, cool. that was his original teleplay. Neat. So, Neat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I guess I'll read it in script form because, you know, comics are for kids and I'm an adult. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> anyway, uh, Harlan Ellison, for kids. You heard it yeah. here first. Yeah. What struck you specifically, things in the episode, because... I think I've reviewed this episode for this podcast before. Probably. And I kind of just go like, it's all perfect. Let's move on to the next episode. Yeah, I get that feeling. So we're going to have to, you know, draw it out for a bit. Um, What struck me? God, it's like the, the vague mystery of it all just doesn't matter as much because the core of the episode is really just the emotional stakes. It is the past, and yes, knowing that it leads to a future that is, you know, preferable over the one where the Nazis win. Um, yeah. But other other than that, it's not, like, I'm actually not held up by the concept <clears throat> of the episode and why didn't they delve into the donut thing. Right. Uh, like, th- they don't have to. That's like Joker's it is, past. You don't want it to be- It is, exactly. It is specifically inexplicable. Like, we cannot fathom it. Good. Perfect. Leave it that way. Because it doesn't matter. It's just the vehicle for jump at a random moment, end up in some time period. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's all you need to then have, you know, the, oh, oh, I recorded it. So we got to try to jump at the same moment and like, we'll we'll miss by a couple weeks. Like, that's fun. That's good shit. Yeah. And I love that that they, I love that they thought to give explanation to like, oh, well, you know, if if there are rivers and eddies of time, then he should be along, you know, directly. Like, he'll yeah, probably yeah. wind up at the Didn't same have to make people. perfect sense, but it was just like, yeah, let's not overthink this. We're going to end up at this Nexus event, like whatever you want to call it. But yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is a good way to just wave away the concerns of what if he ends up in South America? Nah. <laughs> That <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't really make that would suck for the story is what that would do. Yeah. Um, and it's just oh the gut punch of finding out like no 
this this delightful good human being has to die because otherwise she will fuck with world war ii <laughs> yeah and we actually need the violent assholes to be the ones going into war like that's dark and i love it and it's just so heartbreaking and then it's such a chaotic unraveling that i was like that uh, not until mccoy says like i could have saved her you stopped me i i was like wait who is what is they're both trying to run out of what is happening and then i realized oh no no he ran after mccoy and stopped him from yeah. oh god that's such a, a, a terrible fucking ending and i love it like that's good shit that's just great and you know it's coming, but it still has to work out in a way where it's like, oh, God, it wouldn't have happened if not for us. That's what I love about time travel. When it, you know, all pieces together in such a way where you're like, oh, yeah, she wouldn't have crossed the road otherwise, but she had to actually get in, into it. And, oh, well, oh, we know that she was, shit. we know that she was part of when well, she died in an auto accident, some sort of auto accident. Yeah. Like some some traffic says. accident, yeah. But that's not necessarily the accident that we just saw. That's true. We don't okay. know if that was the original version, but also it's fine to think that it always was in a way, so... No. Well, you know, this episode... It works of, either way, and I like that. This episode sort of works in, a, in, a, in an interesting capacity because it... I mean, again, I don't know. I mean, are we... Is this from Harlan? Is this from... This particularly is from Harlan? I don't know. I don't know exactly, because I know they changed a lot of the dialogue, most of the dialogue, sure. everything but two lines. So Oof. the explanation of the the rivers and eddies and whatnot, mm. but that combined with what we see in Edith almost falls down the steps and Kirk saves her. Yeah. And he's like, she could have died right there. Yeah. There is precedent for believing that in the Star Trek universe, when you mess with time, you create a wound, and when that wound heals, it will try to force things back the way they're supposed to be. So mm. it was like the timeline itself forcing Edith down those stairs. Right. Oh, that's fun. Because that scene was already like, oh, what if it's not a traffic accident? Because you're like, what if, what if you instinctively saved her, and now you're too fucking late, and you, you what, you're going to have to shoot her? Like, what is yeah. the solution here? It's time travel, like that, final that destination. That poise- yeah, that poses such a cruel moral quandary. I I love it. That hits home. That's just poignant. Yeah, and I, I I dig that. That's just there's no way around it. And and them just trying to adapt to this impoverished existence in in a past they're unfamiliar with. It's great. It's just mm-hmm. you, they're so out of their element, and yet they're also in an element that people aren't necessarily familiar with. Like most people watching Trek aren't actually you know going to the shelter to get some soup um unless it happens to be on the tv at the shelter i guess uh i I don't know syndication um but it's just delightful to see them in in regular clothes just pretending to going along with it trying to tinker with some some electric wire in their shared room like it's such a different vibe but it works so perfectly well yeah I th- I think just everything about this episode works on a yeah. weird level that you wouldn't anticipate. Um, what did you think? How did you interpret Edith Keeler seemingly having some version of prognostication? Yeah, it was at some points it was a little too on the nose where it's like, okay, it really has to seem like she knows knows. But usually it was at a level where I could still just see it as, no, she is truly this hopeful this optimistic uh looking beyond uh, the current struggles of humanity and trying to envision a future the way they were quite literally doing at the time like it had to it makes sense for there to be people who were like what if what if we go to the moon before it happens because someone has to have the stupid idea to try Mm -hmm. um and and like they said, like, yeah, the atomic weapons and stuff, they, they also had to happen. Like, there, there's yeah. a bunch of developments that, that need to <clears throat> come before this, this actual future. And she's not looking into that, as would also be, as, as is evident from just the fact that 
she would have prevented the atomic weapons being on time to yeah. screw with World War Two. So she's not she doesn't know the path there. She's just like we we could do better. We there there is a sky full of stars out there and and we should be eventually done messing around here and and exploring what's out there once we have our society fucking in order. And that speaks to her her enormous optimism within a very dark corner because she's not running the brightest of places. She's just dealing with people who are really down in the dumps. And yeah. it's that contrast is what works for her to be such a kind soul and therefore such a loss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think... I, I didn't take it as actual prognostication, at least, no. I, yeah, I didn't either. I just, you know, uh, you hear people talk about that on this episode. Uh, so I just, I wanted to see what you thought about it because I've always felt like it was a co- a mixture of optimism and then her just being intuitive and very observant because... When- it's just, there's a bunch of fantasy involved trying to make these concrete predictions that happen to be yeah. true. But if they hadn't been true, you wouldn't have had the fun interplay with Kirk. And yes, she is observant enough to notice that these fuckers aren't, you know, slightly out of place. What are you doing here? Yeah. And then I love that bit where he tells Kirk he's going to do the thing and she's like, Captain. And they're like, what? Even when he doesn't yeah. says it, he does. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's that's such an eerie moment, but it works. Yeah. It's fine, you know. And it is explained by, yeah, yeah, we used to serve together in a in a way that, you know, would make sense. Or she's like, yeah, yeah, I figured, you know, something like that. Yeah. And, and that's fine. Because there is very clearly that mutual respect, but the relationship between Kirk and Spock that is clearly not just, oh, we're buddies, we've, we're brothers, we've been through all of this. No, it's it's very much a yes, sir uh, kind mm-hmm. of vibe without the explicit, you know, when other people are around. Yeah. Now, so yeah. It makes sense. Like, she's good at what she, you know, sees. <laughs> While I, I mean, like, I don't, I think she has the charisma. I think she has the speaking mm. ability and the optimism. I think she's always had those things. Yeah. I personally, though I don't see it as prognostication, what happened in that episode, I really like to, like, grab also the hyper intuitiveness and the perceptiveness observation, I guess. I don't know. Um, about Kirk and Spock and how they operate. Mm -hmm. I'd like to look at it like how many times did they talk about how she's the focal point? If she is the focal point of two separate timelines, I don't know. Time travel's going on. Maybe she has dreams. Maybe she has ideas that she normally wouldn't have had. Uh, You know, certain observational skills that she wouldn't have normally had. Maybe she's drawn to certain things. She knows certain things about Kirk. Yeah, she could have weird dreams so, or something. So that, that, that could be know? fine, but you don't have to make we that explicit. So that yeah. yeah, it's not in the episode. It's a fun thought to have. You know, I like the this idea I get that, that you know. Um, At the same time, I th- wonder if she already was the focal point before McCoy went back. Maybe like doesn't doesn't that create a focal point by him accidentally saving someone who mattered? Or mm-hmm. would have mattered had they not died. Yeah. That's where the river stuff comes in, and it's like a, a tad on the mysterious side, but... It's just enough for it's me. It's not what you're supposed to be thinking about, anyway. Like It's not, but one of the things I love about it is that they put as much thought as they did into... Because clearly you could have explained it more clearly. They chose not to. Yeah, yeah. And it just adds... A little magic where it's like it it feels more like a fairy tale love thing between her and Kirk because there is this sort of inexplicable connection of oh yeah, we share this idea of a common future and she sees him in, in ways that he's not used to being seen. Stuff mm-hmm. like that, where it's like that that adds to the vibe. And if you were to make that explicit and have some rational explanation or less rational explanation, it it would only harm her character. Yeah. And we're just there for the, oh, no, she's a special person. And we feel that because she is so different than anyone else out there. I think one of the interesting things about the episode, too, is that clearly, again, Vietnam, you know, they're going to talk about World War II, but it's so Mm. they don't have to say, you know, 
that's what MASH was, is just being like, oh, we're going to talk about Korea instead of uh, Vietnam. Yeah, 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 the other one we lost. So uh, when you look <laughs> when you look at it like that, you're like, okay, so Star Trek is doing it in a way where they're saying, we agree with peace, we agree with pacifism. However, sometimes pacifism is the wrong time for it. Sure. Sometimes to get to I a better I think Vietnam point. is the wrong time to get that message out there, but... I think that's what they were doing, though. I do. I think maybe one of the things that Roddenberry changed, I don't know, I haven't read all the different versions of the script, but maybe there was maybe there was something where either by his own philosophy at the time, Roddenberry changed mm. a lot over the course of his life. Sure. Um, it's easy to call Vietnam a bad idea once you've seen the outcome, yes, sure. Yes, but, uh, you know, there were people who were against Vietnam then, and there was a growing... Yeah. You know, smart take, people. Take note that there was like a growing pacifistic movement at the mm-hmm. time. And then also in the script, Edith Keeler caused a massive pacifistic movement. Yeah. But Spock points out at the wrong time, the right idea mm-hmm. at the wrong time. That's fair. I think there was a little yeah. pro war in there. I think there was a little pro war. Pro war. Mayhaps, war. but but at the same time, you could also interpret that line as uh, that was the wrong time. Now, now was a pretty good time. Yeah, because uh, I don't see Vietnam, you know, being Nazi Germany and taking over the world with their atomic weapons. Right, it which is be. what you know, those, like it's a proxy war, but still. But the people back then would say mm. that would be like, well, if we hadn't done something in World War II, look what would have happened. Well, you don't know that. This is a sci-fi show. <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying <laughs> in yeah, real life, yeah. people said sure. Vietnam was justified by virtue of look what would have happened if we hadn't got, done the World War Two. Yeah, so you know if that's your logic and Russia's the big bad, really just just do a land invasion of the USSR. Yeah, that but, that seems like a better idea. But uh, yeah, that, I think there was just uh, that's my little pro-war rant. Yeah. I know there was some. Yeah, some no, text. I I get you. You you can you can take that from it. I definitely ignored that context while watching it because it is yeah. very much about the hypothetical for me it is the scenario of the the impact of that choice that mm-hmm. having to do something so against your own sense of ethics and morality and also you know she's hot so would prefer right. to just stick around and bone but mm, yeah you know it happens so lots of don't great... date activists, I guess. No, I yeah. would fuck myself over. Never mind. <laughs> One of my favorite things in this episode is McCoy screaming, "Killers, assassins! I won't <laughs> let you. I'll kill you first. Uh, I, I he's uh, pretty that. out of it throughout the episode, and you know it's a bit of a contrivance, but it works. We need a reason for him to run off and be out of it and slowly recover. I guess, yeah. <clears throat> So uh, the only one of two lines of dialogue that was actually left of Harlan's in this episode. (laughs) God damn it. Comes from the Guardian Forever. A question. Mm -hmm. Since before your son burned hot in space and before your race was born, I have awaited a question. That was it. Uh, Fair enough. It sounds like good prose. Makes sense. Yeah. I think the other one was at the end where the Guardian says, time has regained its shape. Or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, some some shit like that where it's like, okay, these these barely matter. Fair enough. I, I, I mean, I get that they have to adapt it to suit the characters they've already established. Then again, last episode, I didn't feel like it was the same character as some other episodes. Yeah. But I, I, I get it. I don't know what type of characters they were pre-intervening normal staff writers uh yeah going over it for another couple drafts so well who's to say i haven't read it yeah oh it's off it's weird it's mm. it is not the characters no um, sure. but yeah i you know personally i loved the line since before your son burned hot in space and before your race was born i have awaited a question that is such a cool sense yeah. it, it is, is one sentence of world building that has no further explanation, but but it's just dope. It's just it's epic. so cool. Yeah, um, that's just oh, good sci-fi writer at work. Yay. Yeah, and and the, are you machine or being? And he says, I am both and neither. I am my own beginning, my own ending. 
like, what does that mean? Fuck all. What does that's, that mean for the universe? Yeah. Like, I love those kinds of lines. There's just like, yeah. what? Yeah, am I supposed to? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, McCoy stabs himself, goes back into the past. Uh, the, I love that the, the, the episode comes right into the action with, like, mm-hmm. the temporal waves yeah. that's been messing yeah. with their instruments for weeks. Exactly, it's great. Immediate res, straight off the bat. Stuff is happening. Absolutely. And it's thematically connected because it is pointing towards the object of interest that will set off the series of events. Yeah. One thing about it, like, I, th- there's a, an issue where Spock says the transporters were aimed directly at the source of the transmissions, the time waves or whatever. Why? Why were <laughs> they? He just, exp- he just said, by the way, it was like just pointed there we don't know why he doesn't even say we don't know why he just says oh yeah it was was pointed there (laughs) um i i i don't even remember that part because enough happens this episode but it is i mean you're not you're not gonna mccoy wakes Hmm? up from stabbing from overdosing himself and he screams killers assassins and all that and then like gets off the bridge and and they're like someone just transported and spock is like captain the transporters were aimed at the source of the yeah. Did McCoy do it? Did he like put it there it's, knowing Because it sounded it was... like he would just run in. But then again, if the waves of temporal energy, whatever the fuck, are messing with all of the equipment anyway, you could imagine that they might have a magnetic pull on some of the direction he equipment in the transporter room. I'm yeah. good with that. Yeah, you know, I think it's interesting the way McCoy keeps screaming killers, assassins, I won't let you, I'll kill you first, I won't let you, you won't get me, murderers, killers. Mm. If he injects himself with this shit, and it, yeah, it's supposed to make you paranoid, if it's, you have too much, it makes you yeah. paranoid and go nuts. But what mm-hmm. if when his brain is in that state, he is sensing the temporal wars mm. and like going back in time and changing things, he's like talking about all these like, People from different timelines. I mean, like they're they're never gonna say yeah, that was yeah. a thing. No, but... but it's fun to imagine some sort of specific madness. But then again, like we know about the substance about the cortisine that it has the effect of paranoia. Mm-hmm. If there was no temporal intervention of those waves, if the energy source wasn't nearby, would it have had the same time warpy, oh my god, I'm hallucinating all of the different lines uh, type of effect? Yeah. Like, at that point, what does the quadrazine do? Yeah. Because I mean... you're also going to have that effect, supposedly, without the thing being close. Yeah, you can have, like, the paranoia, maybe, but then, like, the temporal waves might be, like, channeling a specific vision or idea. I suppose, but that could be anything. So at that point, it doesn't really have an impact. Uh, uh, it doesn't oh. have an impact, but, uh, you know, yeah, I don't know. I have pieces of ideas in my head sometimes. Yeah, of course. No, it would be easy. It, it, it would be doable to, like, imagine a version of events where that is more explicitly what happens and, and he is engaging with something larger other mm-hmm. than, you know, I don't trust anyone anymore, <laughs> which is also fair. Uh, so what did you think of Kirk saying that Spock was Chinese? God, right. That was <laughs> that was really awkward, but it was funny. Like, the joke for me was mostly Kirk having to come up with something and doing an extremely bad job. Yeah. Like, He's for just... me, it was mostly like, this police <laughs> officer should really cut you off right about now because this is going very poorly. But I, I was like, mm, at first, and then I was like, oh, God, this is just... The, the joke is on Kirk for this one. I'm yeah. not supposed to take it seriously. Like, if the police officer would have been like, yes, of course, I had already noticed he was Chinese and his ears uh, have had an accident. And, you know, like, no, the story yeah. was just way too long. And that's that's the, the fun bit about it. Like, if you're going to make up anything about an alien that's, like, not quite... And especially in that era, like, oh, God, how how often did you see Asian people, I suppose? Like, ugh. yeah. Um, Feels like a later wave of immigration. I don't know. Do we have a specific locale? For this? I guess yeah. maybe New York, I guess. I thought, I thought yeah, I guessed as well, but I wasn't sure if that was explicitly mentioned or if it was just some I city. S- 
don't remember. I know Fair it's enough. really I know it's really just Mayberry from Andy Griffith's <laughs> show. It's the same Fair town enough. same town they were in in uh Miri. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh look different though. <laughs> yep, sure did. Um <laughs> So yeah, it, different it's streets. A, it feels weird, but yeah, he says my friend is obviously Chinese. I see you've noticed the ears; they're actually obviously. easy to explain. He caught his <laughs> head in a mechanical rice picker. <laughs> that's that's where it gets stupid. Like where it's like, oh god, you really couldn't think of anything less stupidly racist. And that's just at that point, I'm I'm entertained not by I'm I'm not laughing at at Spock or at Chinese people. I'm just like. God, Kirk, you unimaginative dumbass. It's just, this is the best we could do. It makes sense for the character. I'm fine with it. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not mad at it. You know, it's, it's sure it's not entirely, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't make the joke now, but uh, yeah, but you just to also... avoid potential controversy. Like I'm, I'm good with the, the, I don't the think, yeah, I don't think is like the worst racist joke ever is just no it is easily headcanoned if you want to if you feel like giving the show a pass you could be like it's perfectly plausible that kirk would be like i'm in 1930 what do these people know in the u.s about china okay Fuck so all. yeah he's yeah no that's, that that's sort yellow. of what i would expect yeah i i already incorporated that like they don't know how yellow. Like it might be yeah. Vulcan yellow. <laughs> like yeah, they, they don't know shit. <laughs> they know their eyes are different. Vulcan eyes are a little bit different. You know, they got a lot of makeup on there. And then he's oh like, shit, the ears. <laughs> uh, yeah. Damn it, the ears. What are they, what else do they know about uh, Chinese people? Rice, rice. rice. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's so that's the stupidity of it. Where like yeah yeah I can laugh at it, and I I mean I'm not gonna decide for any other people like whether yeah. or not they should what they should think of that joke like eh, it was the 60s and no. it's not it's not blatantly offensive it's just it's definitely pointing fun at like poking fun at the the people not really realizing yeah. anything about anything <laughs> you know how you can watch something over and over again and always root for a different outcome mm. and then still somehow be disappointed that it didn't happen <laughs> I have forever wanted to hear that cop say, all right, all right. What do you think? I'm stupid. I automatically knew he was Chinese. (laughs) I recognize that as a Chinese man. Come on now. (laughs) Don't you think I know what a Chinese man looks like? Of course I know he's Chinese. But you were stealing clothes. (laughs) Yeah. No. Well, um, it's it's really not, not the most important thing. But... I mean, yeah. Do do you still have that same feeling of please do something else uh, with the actual conclusion, or is that less so? Because if oh, I wasn't actual, expecting you to go here necessarily. No, the conclusion of the show I've always liked. Like I love. Oh no, it's great. Yeah. I, no, I mean, it is good. But do you emotionally root for her to live or I do. something to happen differently? Yeah. Yeah, but I like. Yeah. I like the actual plot. And the way that it, I'm in love with the plot and the actual way the story resolves more than I am yes. her. Yeah. So like that, you know, the the beauty of the story. She is a woman we haven't met who lived years ago. So fair enough. Yeah. I, it's, I would much rather. If have you were story. in love with her, that would be weird. She is fictional. Yeah. I mean, in love with as far as like just loving a character, but. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. That's a thing too. Just, you know, caring about them, caring about yeah. a fictional thing. I try and do both, but yes, yes, yeah. From, do you realize what you've done? He he knows, doctor, he knows. Yeah. Uh, to when they come back through the Guardian of Forever, and I love the Guardian is, like, kind of sad. He's like, all as, as it was before, many such journeys are possible. Let me be your gateway, like... He's mm. bored. He's been sitting there for all these. He's millennia. like, do it again, do it again, please, God. It's a long yeah. time, forever. <laughs> Come inside my hole again. <laughs> I haven't had contact in so long. Please, you fucking use me like the slut I am, because God, Jesus. No. 
There is there is a an an element of this is eternal loneliness, and I serve one purpose, and literally no one ever makes use of it because it's dangerous as fuck, uh-huh. and it will mess up entire lives of millions and billions of people. But you know, you can see the past. Yay, it's fun. Have yeah. you always wanted to live back when things were better? <laughs> Go find out if they were, and then you know be yeah. unable to return. Oh. <laughs> um, also, how did they return? Oh, he just said, if you're able to change it, you will be returned. Oh, fair enough. Sure. That's all he said. All right. But, uh, so they return. The Enterprise is up there. They're asking if we want to beam up. Kirk's response, a choked up, let's get the hell out of here. I love that as an ending. Yeah, it's good. It is very much long silence, and you can just feel the weight of the emotion still on his shoulders, and that's the best way to to, to handle it. We just had to make sure that a good person died... Yeah. And he lost the love of his life. Yeah, okay. and it yeah. and it is very much it almost makes you feel responsible for every atrocity since. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah, the alternative was worse, but also there's a difference between having to accept that history went the way it did and mankind did the shit they did, and having to actively choose no, this was the best of all possible timelines, so I, I guess I need the eugenics war to happen and this and that and everything they know of only to get to the point of we're now in a in a safer place i guess and and things mm. are better but also a lot of people had to die like yep. we, we it ultimately yes we wanted to stop the nazis but also yeah we had to drop some atomic weapons on fucking another country so you know it's not yeah. it's not all great news or anything <laughs> there's there's dark. just a lot of there's just a lot of that'll fuck you up man type shit where yeah. it's like yeah you have to live with that now mm. which i'm sure we'll notice next episode <laughs> no then but it's not it's not that yeah. type of show yet but like there is a yeah. it's it's just it's a heavy heavy episode and it takes its time to get there but the build-up is so well done there it's tense enough to just keep you fearing that ending and then it resolves itself in minutes and that's also part of the gut punch where it's just like yeah you have a bit of kirk silence to sort of let it sink in but then it's over like you're fucked like go deal with this for the rest of your night Mm -hmm. and that's just good storytelling (laughs) it's unfortunately very good (laughs) doesn't mean you have to enjoy it or like it Like, like you know what word i mean not like i did enjoy it and i did like it but ugh it is it is the type of enjoyment where I'm in like, oh god, I orgasming. Why can't I be a happy person? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh so the title of this episode refers to both the dead city on the time planet and New York itself, where the timeline will either be restored or disrupted. In Ellison's ah. original draft Kirk, upon first seeing the city sparkling like a jewel on a high mountaintop, reverently says it looks like a city on the edge of forever. Hmm. In Ellison's first treatment for this episode, the city they traveled back to in time was to Chicago. I mean, uh, sure. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't have noticed the difference on screen, probably, because they would have used the same set. <laughs> yep. When asked in a February 26th, 1992 interview whether the makers of this episode consciously intended it to have the contemporaneous anti-Vietnam War movement as subtext, Robert H. Justman replied, of course we did. Shut the fuck up, authors. I want to do my own interpreting. But yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Did did you realize at the time in the news there was also a war going on? Um, Yeah. Yeah. We might have picked up on that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In the Star Trek compendium, Alan Asherman suggests that the name Keeler is derived from the keel of a ship, the longitudinal element of a vessel that keeps it held together, much as Keeler herself keeps the time continuum from coming apart. It also Mm. could be interpreted as a hybrid of Killer and Healer, a reference to her dual role as the focal point of the time flow. However, in Ellison's first treatment for the episode, Edith's last name was Kostler. (laughs) <laughs> and you're welcome you're reading into it <laughs> uh-huh. 
Well, uh, maybe, delightful. but you had much. Yeah, I mean, know. someone did change it, so it, it ended up being that name. Sure, there was a reason for that, probably. But yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's you know, just a coincidence. Not not as big a deal as you think it might be. Sometimes yeah. you're just grasping for what's the German root of this word, and like, hmm. yeah. Sometimes uh, it's just a dumb pun. Not not in this case, but yeah, yeah. Uh, Ellison's original story outline and first draft script did not feature Dr. McCoy, but an Enterprise crewman named Beckwith, who was dealing drugs among the crew. (laughs) I wonder why they changed that. Beckwith murdered a fellow crewman named uh, Lebeck, who was on the verge of turning him in, escaped to the planet the ship was orbiting. There he went through the time vortex operated by a mysterious ancient race called the mm. Guardians. Mm. And apparently... They were, I feel like, like that infringes on some copyrights, but sure. They were very gigantic, and ah. uh, they were like... Which they is were, hard were like for the budget. We, weird old wizards or something. Uh, um, as a result, the Enterprise was gone, and a savage pirate ship called the Condor was in its place full of renegade humans. Kirk and Spock follow Beckwith through the time portal to 1930 Chicago, where Kirk falls in love with young social worker Edith Kostler. Finally, with the help of a legless World War I veteran called Trooper, who dies during the episode's action, they find Beckwith. In the end, Kirk does not stop him from saving Edith. He freezes at the crucial moment, and Spock prevents her rescue instead. In a brief mm. epilogue, Spock visits a grieving Kirk in his quarters and attempts to console him, saying that, quote, no other woman was offered the universe for love. In Ellison's first story outline, Beckwith was sentenced to death after he murdered Lebeck, and Kirk ordered his execution to take place on the next deserted planet the Enterprise comes across. Hence, I get why they cut that out. <laughs> hence, they beam down with Beckwith in a firing squad to the Guardian planet. This was very soon eliminated from the story. In the revised script by Ellison, Beckwith escapes from Spock and jumps into the time vortex again. However, he ends up trapped in a supernova time loop, which kills him over and over again. (laughs) Dark. Love it. But also, wait, where did the rest of the story go? Yeah. Ellison also wrote scenes in which the regular characters acted very much unlike their usual selves. For instance... Kirk and Spock get into a heavy argument when Spock, witnessing a street speaker calling out against foreign immigrants, called the human race barbaric. Kirk then claims he should have just left Spock to be lynched by the mob. I mean, once again, I'm I'm in favor of Spock, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh God! Says so Zira, yeah. Ellison's script was deemed unusable for the series for many different reasons. Gene Rodden. <laughs> Gene Roddenberry objected to the idea that drug usage would still be a problem in the 23rd century. Dude, did you forget about I, Mud? Or Mud's women, Mm -hmm. sorry. And even present among Starship crews. Also, the production staff was heavily against Kirk's final inactivity, claiming that if Kirk was unable to decide and act, viewers would never be able to accept him as a strong leader figure in later episodes. Certain elements of the script such as the Guardians and the Condor and his crew, were impossible, simply impossible to create on the series' budget. Yeah. There was a lot of contention for many years. Like Gene Roddenberry just started coming out and telling crazy versions of the story, like Harlan Ellison wrote it once, and then he refused to write it again without compensation. Uh, and I mean, so, that's fair. That sounds like him, but... <laughs> yeah, that does sound like him. But, but give the man his fucking money. Like, except come on. We, He's except doing we, more labor. Except we have proof that he did do, like, two other rewrites. <laughs> exactly. We know that now. But also, if he wanted to get paid for those rewrites, perfectly fine with me. Yeah. The man is also, doing extra work. Roddenberry was like, then Harlan wanted to... He had Scotty as a drug dealer. That, that wasn't not, Scotty. No. Yeah. No. no. You just make it up stuff to make it, you know... Yeah. To make it worse, yeah. Because, like, oh, the freezing at the end would have been so, so heartbreaking. Like, I love that. That's so good. I'm good with mm-hmm. that. Like, make does that make it hard for us to accept him as a strong, infallible fucking leader? Maybe, sure. But, like, I'm, I already have my nuances with, is he a leader I trust? Because I instantly distrust any authority figure. So I'm yeah. like, hmm... 
so strong original. leader my ass like if he d- if he can't decide that makes him human <laughs> that makes it an interesting fucking story like i'm good with that yeah the rest of it sure that's that's some superfluous weird shit that was cut out so yeah we wound up with uh they wanted steven karabatsis to uh rewrite it he did not he was not available Mm -hmm. uh ellison uh, rewrote it at least once maybe twice it seems like Mm -hmm. and that was also deemed unsuitable uh gene l coon producer and writer also got himself into the rewriting and then dc fontana did that did rewrite on the script and then uh it was also slightly rewritten by Roddenberry to become the final shooting draft. But apparently, according to this, much of the finished episode is the product of Fontana, who went uncredited, of course. Sure. Kuhn is mainly responsible for the small comical elements of the show, including the famous rice picker scene, which Ellison ah. reportedly hated. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Ellison was dismayed with the changes Roddenberry and Fontana made to his story, so much so that he wished his credit to read written by Cord Wainer Bird. A, a, and this was a request Roddenberry denied. Though Ellison yeah. had the final right to have a pseudonym attached, he claims that Roddenberry made veiled threats that if he did so, he would be blackballed in the television and motion picture industry. Despite the feud, Roddenberry listed this as one of his top ten favorite episodes in an issue of TV Guide celebrating the 25th anniversary of Star Trek. In his own defense, mm. Ellison stated he had no real problem with DC Fontana rewriting him, but rather with the extent and number of unpaid rewrites the studio and network got out of him, to say nothing of exaggeration-prone Gene Roddenberry telling fans that Ellison's script showed Scotty selling drugs. The script yeah. didn't even feature Scotty. Um, Roddenberry apparently denied Ellison's pseudonym request because he knew everyone in the science fiction community was aware that the Cornwainer bird credit was Ellison's way of signaling his dissatisfaction with the way production people treated what he wrote. It would have meant that Star Trek was no different than all the other science fiction shows and mistreating quality writers and could have resulted in prose science fiction writers avoiding contributing to the program. That makes sense. Yep. This was the most expensive episode produced during the first season with a budget of $245,316 U.S. And also the most expensive episode of the entire series, except for the two pilots. Uh, The average cost of a first season episode was around $190,000. Also, production went one and a half days over schedule, resulting in eight shooting days instead of the usual six. Mm -hmm. I mean... What's fifty thousand dollars in sixties currency? Oh well, Hollywood. Mm. Yeah, let me let They'll me see. Live. They they clearly you know they they got it back. I think I think it's fair to say by now they got their money's worth out of. This I don't IP. think they would agree, but they never do. Yeah, that's fair. Well. I just won't take the complaining very seriously. All right, so $245,316 in 1967 is equivalent in purchasing power to about $2,294,013.08 today. Yeah, that's a that's a long Game of Thrones yeah. episode. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> yeah. That's a yeah. big one. This is a scene, there is a scene in the original 1960s broadcast version that has been partially deleted in some editions. When McCoy meets Rodent holding the milk bottle, the scene ends with McCoy collapsing, then runs to McCoy meeting Keeler in the mission. But then they've, they've said mm. that was edited out for years. But uh, Why? Probably because it just wasn't important to the story. And here they, they uh, cut down old episodes over the years to put in more uh, commercials. More ads. Yeah, fair. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, yeah, it works. Darn shame, sure. It's, but it's not the most important scene. No. Fair enough. I did like it, though. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, guess what? The network really wanted to uh, for them to take out, let's get the hell out of here. Because <sighs> of the profanity, yeah. I take it. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is fun. Uh, the Guardian... That's why we're not on a fucking network. That's why, yeah. So The Guardian of Forever was designed by art director Roland M. Brooks. Normally, set design was mm-hmm. the purview of his colleague Matt Jeffries, but due to illness, Brooks mm-hmm. took over his chores for The Guardian. When Jeffries returned to his duties and saw the donut-shaped set piece for the first time, he reportedly exclaimed, What the hell is this? <laughs> what was his idea? What would he have done? I don't know. I don't know. but I, It's fine. I love the, the design of The Guardian of Forever. It's... Wonderful. Yeah, I have no issues with it. It's fine. Yeah. This thing has won a bunch of awards, and Harlan's sure. script won him an award, and 
Uh, Congrats. They got a Hugo Award for the Best Dramatic Presentation. It was, yeah. Neat. It's it's good. People recognize good. Yeah. So, last little bit of trivia here. The 2006 Crucible trilogy of novels follows up on plot Mm. elements from this episode in Provenance of Shadows by David R. George III. It is shown what happened to the version of McCoy and Earth when he went back in time and altered history by saving Edith. McCoy places constant ads trying to signal for help in the future, but soon realizes that no help is coming. On advice, he makes his way south, ending up in a small town outside of Atlanta. There he becomes the local doctor, marries a widow, and is eventually killed Mm. when the hostilities with the Nazis spilling into U.S. borders in his timeline escalate. The novel also reveals that in the proper timeline, Kirk and Spock spent 47 days in New York City from January to March 1930. Dang. So yeah, that's I want to read that trilogy. That makes sense now. That's cool. Yeah, I get that. Um, you got anything else? I, I'm I'm just happy we we made it this far without going. Yeah, yeah, it's great. End of episode. So, I'm 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 proud that we did as well as we did. Yeah. Um, it's just like yes, this is what I want the fucking show yeah. to be. So more more of this. And we'll see how much of this I get. Yeah. But I'm, I'm I'm very happy to have seen yeah. it. Yeah. Oh no, I I totally get why it's one of your favorites. I would be remiss to not mention that one of Harlan's complaints is uh, that he turned into script, and they saw that he said that there were runes all over the place, mm-hmm. and he thought some idiot went rune. What the hell is a rune? He must mean ruin. So that's why, like, oh, there are ruins all over the place. That's an option let's be real <laughs> i love it uh, that would be sad yeah but i like the way they did it so i'm all right it looks fine like uh yeah i think there's runes would have just tied it to a very specific kind know, of time and place and, yeah uh that is it for our review of the city on the edge of forever please join us next time it's all downhill from here <laughs> <laughs> God, yeah. I'm, I, I know how to sell it, don't I? Yeah, you do. Uh, but you know what? We sorry. we got a flapjack attack on Mr. Spock's back. We <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> we finished out the first season with Operation <sighs> Annihilate. You all right? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> I'm all right. I'm all right. All right. Well, until next time, Joe Launch. It's accurate. Live long, prosper. Plank on a clit and eat a dick, people. Eat a dick. It's almost solemn now. <laughs> Eat a dick. <laughs> Till next time. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a stranded panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 